Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, so welcome to the January edition of the uh, CAFE seminar series. Uh, today, we're very pleased that uh, Teresa Kushler from NYU will be presenting her paper on social network, network shape beliefs and behavior, evidence from social distancing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the presentation will be followed by a discussion by Harrison Hong from Colombia. Uh, thank you again, Harrison, for uh, accepting to, to give the discussion. I realize it's a lot of, a lot of work, so it's most appreciated. Uh, as usual, there will be uh, 30 minutes for the presentation, 30 minutes for the discussion, and 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, we encourage participants to turn on their cameras. It feels like a closer to the you know, experience of a early physical seminar. Um, and that's it. Teresa, the screen is yours. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to present um, our PP here, Social Network Shaped Belief and Behavior, Evidence from Social Distancing During the COVID-19 Pandemic. So this is joint work with my frequent co-authors, Mike Bailey, um, who's at Facebook, and Johannes Schubel, who's my colleague here at NYU Stern, as well as Drew Johnson, Martin Kunnan, and Dominic Russell, actually all by now uh, at Harvard PhD students. So the mo oh, here we go. Um, the motivation for this paper, and you know, we had hoped that when we originally started the paper, by now we just wouldn't be an up-to-date topic anymore. But unfortunately, it is, is that we find ourselves in a global COVID-19 um, pandemic, and especially in the beginning, before we had vaccines or other measures to. Um, contain the pandemic, there were persistent appeals for people to social distance to contain the pandemic. But we've seen big differences in both the support for and also ultimately the, the compliance with um, these um, suggested social distancing measures. And so what we want to ask in this paper is, well, what contributes to this? What shapes beliefs about the pandemic as well as people's social distancing behavior? And so in this paper, what we do is we use um, individual level the identified data on social networks as well as mobility, which we're going to use to proxy for social distancing from Facebook to show two things. The first one is that social network exposure to COVID-19 cases shapes individuals' actual social distancing behavior. Specifically, we find that people who have more friends in areas with higher caseloads, they reduce their mobility, and we're going to look at this mostly in the first month of the pandemic, they reduce their mobility more, they're more likely to stay home, they're less likely to um, be in different places. We also find as the pandemic progresses that changes in friend exposure predict changes in mobility. And that's going to be the key to you know, address um, concerns about uh, unobservables that could be correlated with exposure at the onset of the pandemic. We'd also argue that it's not driven by differential ability to work from home. So after we've documented that um, people social distance more when they're more exposed to COVID-19 in their friend network, we then ask, well, why might that be? And we show that social network exposure to COVID-19 shapes people's stated expressed beliefs about the pandemic. Specifically, we show that people who have more friends in areas with more COVID cases, they tend to post more on Facebook about COVID-19, indicating that this, this is a topic that they um, engage more with. Um, conditional on posting, they're more likely to post um, in support of social distancing, less likely to post opposing social distancing measures. So at least they express statements by these people are more supporting uh, those, those pandemic containing measures. And finally, we also showed that they're less likely to join these uh, reopen groups. Um, these were basically Facebook groups that advocated for reopening the economy and um, loosening restrictions and basically opposing most of the pandemic containing social distancing measures. 
With that said, let me jump in and tell you how we, uh, how we showed us how we reached these conclusions. So for the data, we use three different types um, of data. The first one is the anonymized network data from Facebook. So for an individual that includes her friendship links, and this is going to be important, the location of where her friends are uh, located, where they live. And then we have some individual level um, information, most importantly, the individual's own location, as well as some baseline characteristics. Second, we use information on actual uh, mobility for a subset of users. And these are users who have location history settings turned on. These are users who voluntarily share more location information uh, with Facebook. And based on this information, we have um, two types of uh, measures for each person. So basically, in this mobility data, the way this is stored is the Earth is divided in a 600 meter by 600 meter squares. And we know for every day whether someone stays in their home tile. So this kind of like square that contains their home uh, on a given day. And we also know how many different number of tiles they visit. And so we're going to use that to measure mobility, how much people move around, how likely they are to stay home. And in home, you know, this is kind of like their narrow neighborhood um, to uh, infer something about social distancing. The final pieces of data are um, public posts and group membership on Facebook, which we're going to use as proxies, as you know, people expressing their beliefs, um, saying what they what they think about the pandemic voluntarily, and so we're going to use that as proxies for what they might actually think, given what they um, what they state. So first of all, I want to um, talk a little bit about a uh, mobility measure and to just show you that this is a plausible way to capture social distancing. So what you see here is mobility over time, um, starting in early February 2020 and going into May. So this is really the onset of the pandemic. And so what you see is that um, when, when you look at uh, the, the first panel where we show the share of users who stay in a single tile, their home tile all day, is that um, you see weekly pattern spikes on weekends, people stay home more, uh, more often. But then really in mid-March, and this is, you know, mid-March was when the pandemic was declared a national emergency in the US, um, mobility goes down, the likelihood of people staying in their home tile on a given day really jumps up and then stays elevated until uh, May. You see the mirror picture on the number of tiles visited, but there's this abrupt jump down down in mid-March, this is when the pandemic really uh, hit and people started to social distance. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to focus on the probability of staying in the home tile, but all results and in the paper we have that are consistent uh, for both. But hopefully that kind of, um, you know, gives you some sense of what we're capturing and the idea that we do seem to be capturing social distancing behavior, at least on the aggregate level. So with that said, we want to now ask whether higher friend exposure to COVID cases leads people to social distance more. And so for our first analysis, we are going to measure friend exposure at the onset of the pandemic as of March 15, which is when it was declared a national emergency. And so for an individual, her friend exposure as of March 15 is summing over all the locations where she has friends, the share of her friends in this location, multiplied by the number of COVID cases at that point in time. So you can think of this as a friend weighted average um, of COVID cases in the locations where she has friends. So I want to point out right away that, of course, there's a big concern that this might be correlated with other characteristics, that um, you know, it's not random where you have friends and it's not random where the first COVID cases hit. So what I'm going to do for now, I'm going to condition for people living in the same CCTA. So this is really neighbors. Um, but we're later, after I've shown you a little bit the raw data, we're going to control for observables and we're going to do a changes on changes specification, which is going to help with this, uh, with this concern. Okay, so for now, 
raw data, we just use two groups. Within each zip code, divide people into do they have above or below median friend exposure. And the within zip code is going to be important here because we're going to compare people who really live in the same zip code, which means local caseloads, local risk, uh, local restrictions are going to be identical. So this is not differences about your own situation, and therefore it must be coming through, through your friends. So here's what we see. In the pre-period, we see really identical uh, movement patterns by these two groups. And remember, this is the raw data, so absolutely no controls yet. In mid-March, both groups start staying home more. Everyone starts staying home more. But we see what we see is this um, divergence between people who have above and below median friend exposure. Those with above median friend exposure, those with friends in areas with higher caseloads are staying home much more than those with lower caseloads in their social networks in the same CCTA. So far, raw averages. So now you might, of course, be concerned that there are differences between high and low exposure individuals, namely the first high cases were in New York and Seattle. And so people with friends in New York and Seattle might just be different from people who have fewer friends in those, those areas. So for now, um, I'm going to include controls, and then I'm going to move to a, a changes and changes specification. I want to mention the controls that we include. Um, we include an individual level fixed effect to take out level differences between people. We're also going to allow for, and this is important, time varying fixed effects of the individual and the location, namely the observables that we have a college, age, gender, and then um, measures of which types of electronics they use, um, the proxy to some extent for, um, for, for income and kind of like social class, uh, as well as their location. We also include time varying effects of other network characteristics. So in the same way that we construct friend weighted uh, COVID cases, we instruct friend weighted median household income, population density and the share urban. So this is not just about people having friends in rich areas like New York and Seattle, we would be controlling for this. This is not just people having friends in urban areas. And so when we include those fixed effects, we're going to compare urban friends in urban areas with high caseloads versus friends in urban areas with, uh, with low caseloads. When you do this in the diff and diff, you get a very similar um, picture, basically a baseline of zero differences prior to the pandemic. And then this gap that emerges where people with above median friend exposure are about 1.2 percentage points more likely to stay home on a given day or stay in their home tile. Um, that's a 3.8 increase relative to the below median average of 32%. Um, I also want to mention that we see those same patterns on weekdays and weekends, um, which leads us to think that this is not driven by a differential ability to work from home. If it was, we would expect to see these differences be stronger on weekdays when a higher fraction of people work rather than on, on, on weekends. Um, we can also repeat this controlling for the exact college that people went to. So now we would be comparing people with similar demographics living in the same area who went to the same college. And to the extent that you think, you know, what college and what level of education you have might also proxy for the type of jobs and the type of um, opportunities you have for working from home, uh, we, we find no differences there either. So, so far, we've looked at the exposure at the onset of the pandemic. But even with our controls, you might still be worried that there is something about friend exposure at the onset that is correlated with unobservables. So now we're going to turn to a changes, um, a changes specification where we look at changes in friend exposure and changes in social distancing behavior. So basically what we're asking is, well, you know, take two people living in the same location. So neighbors who look similar on observables. Early and subsequent hotspots in the US were very different. So early hotspots were New York and Seattle. And then as the pandemic progressed, the hotspots moved to Louisiana and to the Midwest. Um, one thing that 
where you can see this in the data is that, for instance, if you look at the correlation of observables with friend exposure, it really varies over time. So on the onset of the pandemic, people who went to college we are more likely to have high friend exposure to COVID cases. Later on, that flips, and actually people who didn't go to college had higher um, friend exposure to college, which is consistent with, you know, the type of people you might think would have friends in New York at Seattle versus maybe um, Louisiana or um, the, the Midwest. And so the question we're basically asking is, let's take two neighbors in the same location when the pandemic hits early on, do we see the person with friends in New York and Seattle social distance more? As the pandemic progresses and these hotspots move, and basically this is a situation in New York and Seattle stabilizes, but cases keep rising in places like Louisiana, the Midwest, um, the South, do people with friends in those areas start to social distance more relative to their neighbors? Who have friends in areas where cases have leveled off. Okay, so that's kind of like the, the, the comparison. So here just those maps about where we see high changes in friend exposure. So this reflects both where the um, where the hotspots of the pandemic are and where people live who have um, friends in those areas. And you see it move um, really, you know, from, from those early hotspots, New York, Seattle, and, you know, some of those Colorado mountain towns. Um, to uh, to hear the, the 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 Midwest and and the South here, and so this is the variation that that we're going to explore. Okay, so using this variation, here's our changes and changes um, specification. I first wanna uh, reiterate the the controls. Um, so we do control for all other network exposure um, fixed effects interacted by month. So we let the um, influence of say having friends in high income areas and high urban areas vary by month. Then we let individual level characteristics and what we do here is we interact zip code, age, gender, whether someone went to college and the type of electronics they have. So this is really people who live in the same zip code um, and, and look very, very similar on the observables. We also let that vary by month and I think you know, that, that's kind of important because what one important thing that that captures is really the local caseload and local restrictions. And so as these can change over time, we would want to account for that. So with those fixed effects in mind, we ask when people have an increase in friend exposure in the prior month, do they start social distancing more? And we see that they do. Okay, so it does really seem that as the pandemic progresses, those people who newly have friends in areas with rising caseloads start to stay home uh, more. We can do this uh, by, by month for each month. And you see that basically we get um, a positive significant coefficient for all months. And it does seem to be that the most recent change has um, the, the, the biggest uh, effect. I want to mention one thing. If you look at those coefficients and look at the magnitudes and think that they are a little bit uh, different, there's one, one you know kind of difficulty we have is namely that the absolute numbers of uh, of cases just changed so dramatically over the pandemic that in the early days we were really talking about you know. 10, 20 confirmed cases in New Rochelle and in Seattle, a few months in, we were talking about like thousands. And so those, those level differences in the changes um, kind of are, are likely driving some of those differences in, in, in coefficients. Okay, so hopefully so far, I was able to show you um, that individuals with higher friend exposure engage in more social distancing. Now the question is, why is that? Um, and so we want to ask whether maybe part of it is that uh, friend experiences make people more um, aware or more worried about the pandemic and make them kind of think that it's more important to social distance. So now we want to ask, well, is that the case? Do we find an effect of friend experiences on beliefs about COVID-19? 
So we're basically going to repeat our analysis, but we're changing the outcome. So, so far the outcome was, do you actually stay home? Do you use social distance? Now we're gonna replace that with four different outcome measures. And we're gonna look at what does, how does your friend exposure affect these outcomes? And the outcomes we're gonna look at are first, um, whether or not you post about COVID-19 on Facebook. And so we think about this as kind of being an indication of how present the topic is for you, how much you engage with it, how aware you are, because clearly, you know, something that you're not concerned of about something you're not really engaging with, it, this is not something you would necessarily post about. Um, whereas if you at least have the topic present, then you would be more likely to post. Second measure is whether conditional on posting, these posts oppose or support social distancing. So in some sense, that's distinguishing between someone posting, oh my God, this is really terrible. Look at what's happening in New York City. We should really all do our best to contain this pandemic versus someone posting like, people have really lost their minds. This is just like the flu, what's the big deal? Okay, so we're gonna be able to capture that. Um, our, our third measure is going to just be a little bit more fuzzy measure in terms of it measures the general sentiment of all posts, um, including those not concerned about COVID at all, and that it becomes more positive or negative. And you could you know, maybe think that someone who's more worried about the pandemic um, generally might have a slightly more negative tone in their, in their posts. And finally, we look at membership in these reopen groups that have advocated for easing restrictions and reopening the, the economy. In everything we do here, um, we basically have the same controls as before, um, other network exposure fixed effects, as well as, again, the interaction between location and individual characteristics. So really comparing neighbors in the same zip code who look uh, very, very similar on, on observables. Okay, here are the results. First one is the share of posts about uh, COVID. So any post that speaks to the pandemic. And what we find is that if you have higher friend exposure, you're more likely to post about COVID. For magnitudes, if we double your friend exposure, the share of posts um, about COVID goes up by just in a 10% of the baseline, 17.2 um, percentage points. So 10% uh, just under uh, compared to, to the baseline probability. Second, we ask, are you more likely to oppose or support social distancing measures? And what we find is, um, that we see um, that higher friend exposure leads to fewer posts opposing social distancing, and on the flip side, a higher share of posts supporting social distancing. For magnitudes, again, a doubling of friend exposure um, decreases the share of posts um, opposing social distancing by 1.3 percentage points, or by about 3.7 percent of uh, of the baseline probability. So more posts, more posts supporting, fewer posts opposing social distancing. Um, looking at the general sentiment of all posts that someone has on Facebook, we also find that the general sentiment decreases. So the tone overall becomes a little bit more negative. Um, in terms of that same doubling of friend exposure, we see a 3.5% decline relative uh, to the baseline. And finally, um, we find that people who have higher friend exposure are more or uh, less likely to join a reopen group. So for magnitudes, um, most people do not join reopen groups, so the baseline is small. Um, so a doubling of friend exposure reduces the probability of joining such a group by nine basis points, um, which might sound small, but relative on that compared to that relative small baseline, it's 7.35%. Uh, so summing up, it does seem to be the case that um, people with higher friend exposure um, seem to be posting more, supporting, 
social distancing more, opposing it less, um, and joining the open groups um, less. I want to briefly mention in the paper we have um, an additional analysis where we you know expand a little bit and kind of do do a few things to um, to hopefully further. Um, increase your confidence in what that what we're finding is truly what we're finding for that we move to the zip code level um which has one big disadvantage namely that of course at the zip code level we can't control for the zip code we don't have individual level of um, observation so that brings a whole host of uh, identification issues but it does have uh, two advantages. The first one is that we can use a different source of mobility data, namely SafeGraph, which has been used in this context before to just show that um, you know we find very similar results using that mobility data and using um, social connections that are based on the social connectedness index we've constructed earlier that's available at the zip code level um, and publicly available. Um, so there's a different selection of that sample. Um, we find very similar results. It also allows us to um, talk a little bit more about the potential mechanism, but of course it has a much higher potential for confounds. So speaking about the mechanism, um, what SafeGraph, unlike the Facebook mobility data allows, is to look at what type of places people visit. And so in this analysis, we do find that there are fewer visits to non-essential places, namely places of the arts like museums, um, but also entertainment and restaurants, foods and drinks. Um, whereas there's no difference in visits to places that are uh, essential or that are really low context. So healthcare, um, offices of social assistance, parks um, are not affected. And that again supports the idea that what we are capturing is people voluntarily reducing non-essential visits to places that they have discretion over, no effects on others. Similarly, we find in terms of spending that there's uh, reduced spending at places like Starbucks, but there's really no differential spending at Amazon. And so that again suggests that there's a um, reluctance to, to, to go out, not some other thing where people just suddenly spend, uh, spend less. Right? So let me conclude. Um, hopefully what I was able to show you was that higher friend exposure to COVID-19 cases leads people to social distance more. High exposure at the onset of the pandemic affects social distancing for months. Um, and people with high exposure social distance more. It does is not driven by differential ability to work out from home. Most importantly, we find that changes in friend exposure as the pandemic progresses affect changes in mobility. In short, this suggests that friends and you know, what, what friends see and presumably what friends talk about influences people's behavior, in this case, their health behavior. Second, we find that higher friend exposure to COVID-19 cases leads to more posts about COVID, fewer posts opposing, more posts supporting social distancing measures, and um, people are less likely to be members of reopen groups. In sum, it does seem that friends influence um, beliefs or at least stated expressed beliefs um, and opinions about current events, in this case, um, the, the uh, pandemic. And at this point, I I want to mention how I think you know this is maybe something that we might care a little bit more more broadly about. So some of my earlier work has been in how do people form beliefs and how do they form expectations about different economic outcomes. Um, and there we've also found some suggestive evidence that friends influence these beliefs. Um, the pushback we've gotten there was a little bit, you know what, friends are just a free source of information. That is information you have anyways. And if the stakes aren't high or it is hard or difficult for people to access more objective information, then it's very reasonable for people to rely on this, even if potentially biased information. But I think here that's really not the case in this setting. Um, you now, if you think back to early 2020, there really wasn't a lack of 
um, officially communicated um, facts. In fact, people were bombarded with public health messaging by the CDC, by um, you know any type of you could possibly think of authority was trying to get to people and people were presented these um, everywhere in the press as facts, as scientific consensus. So it was comparatively easy for people to get these presumably more objective um, information. Still, we find that friend experiences have this outside um, effect on how people think and ultimately also act uh, during the pandemic. And I think for us, that just, you know, indicates that there's a little more to why people rely on their friends. Uh, and it's not just that uh, they have little, little other information. And with that, I'm out of time. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over. Thank you, Teresa. No, your timing is perfect. You're actually one minute early. Uh, so oh, no. <laughs> could have talked for one more minute um then my 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 watch was slightly early yes anything else you'd like to add no that's okay <laughs> thank you okay uh so harrison uh hong will give the discussion all right great can you hear me yes very well all right thanks let me put this to full screen if i can figure out how to do this All right, can you see it? Look less okay? Yes, very well. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks, thanks. To, um, thanks to uh, Laurent and Ramon for inviting me to discuss this interesting paper by uh, Teresa and her co authors on how social networks shape beliefs and behavior. Um, all right, so, so the basic summary is um, the authors use de identified Facebook user data. Um, to, to, to show that uh, Facebook's US users um, with friends in areas uh, in the US that was worse hit by COVID-19 reduced their, their, their mobility more, okay? And, and, and there's a pretty large literature on, obviously on uh, mobility and social distancing during, the, uh, uh, during COVID. Uh, and, and what the paper does is to link this to um, you know, networks and, 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 and perceptions of risk vis-a-vis of -vis these networks. Uh, the paper uh, has uh, kind of two designs. One is what they call a static design that, that examines uh, essentially the early response to COVID-19 uh, in, 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 in March, 2020, and then a dynamic design where they take advantage of the fact that um, the US, US areas were hit by these sort of rolling waves at different points in time. Uh, and, and I think the other thing that the paper does that that's also uh, pretty novel is, is, is to, you know, basically social mobility is a pretty complicated variable. So they try to uh, link up uh, mobility to, to, to beliefs uh, vis -vis these, these Facebook posts, uh, either supporting reopening or social distancing, right? Um, okay, so. So the contributions, I mean, the, the authors have this ongoing agenda using Facebook data that, that, that obviously has significantly improved our understanding of the role of social networks in shaping a variety of economic outcomes. And here they kind of apply that data to think about uh, 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 social distancing. And, and so I think the paper, you know, really nicely touches on um, a number of important themes. Uh, so social networks and beliefs, which has uh, been more widely explored, but I think here that's pretty interesting is to then link this up further to, to some notion of risk mitigation. And, and I'll highlight the, the risk mitigation part as, as being particularly interesting. I think, you know, I mean, it's not as if COVID-19 is gonna be really the only natural disaster that we're gonna face in a world with global warming. I think if you go to other countries, uh, uh, for instance, in the Philippines right now, um, I, have, I have a bunch of contacts and friends there. I mean, obviously they're dealing with COVID-19, but you know, they're also simultaneously dealing with a lot of typhoons as well. So I think a lot of the themes that, that this paper touches on, I think could be very germane, uh, maybe even more germane uh, going in the future. Okay, so what's the main explanatory variable? Um, 
so they use this this de-identify Facebook data uh, to 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 essentially their main variable is captured by equation one, which is what they call friend exposure, uh, in in March of uh, March fifteen. Uh, so you you basically um, figure out all of uh, so J here indicates uh, in different uh, counties, okay, uh, and so you're you're um, you're an individual uh, person I. You're looking, counting up all your friends in the different counties, J, uh, across the US uh, as of March 15th. And then you kind of normalize by your total number of friends uh, in, your, in your network. And then it's going to be multiplied by uh, the COVID-19 cases uh, on March 15th of J, right? So, so, you know, on March 15th, as Teresa mentioned, it's mostly just uh, 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 small numbers of cases, but, but obviously like in, in certain areas like Seattle and, 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 and New York, okay? Um, so, so essentially this is sort of their, their March 15th friend exposure variable is just kind of capturing, uh, people who have uh, a bunch of friends, uh, uh, in, 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 in Seattle or New York. Okay. And, and this is the, 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 what would they find just kind of doing a simple, uh, um, you know, event study difference and difference calculation. Uh, on the y-axis is the uh, average share of days spent in, in, in this uh, single tile. Uh, that's their measure of uh, social distancing. Uh, and then you can see that uh, as the kind of weeks go by from, from sort of the impact of uh, the announcement of, of kind of the broad uh, recognition of the impact of, of COVID-19, uh, you can see that uh, people with uh, above ZZTA median friend exposure, that's the blue, uh, they ended up, uh, their probability of staying at home uh, was, was, was significantly higher. And, and this is a kind of a big economic effect. Um, and, you know, this is sort of another way of doing it with the average tiles, right? Okay. So the paper is most similar. I mean, I think it's worth, I think, spending a little time. I think it's most similar to, to this, uh, uh, I think this is a paper in science uh, that was published earlier on uh, by Charon Wong Kwan and Persianian. Uh, there, they don't have access to, to the de-identified data. So they use, I think, this, this aggregated Facebook graph data on the propensity for connections, not from a person, uh, but from a location, so kind of from a typical person in a location I uh, to another location J. And, and here, what they were doing was they, they were trying to look at, uh, uh, actually, these, these Facebook graph connections uh, of people living in US cities or counties to actually uh, places in Italy and China, um, okay? Uh, so, so that counties uh, in the US where people had a higher probability of being connected to China and Italy, uh, these were the two early COVID-19 ep uh, epicenters, experienced uh, greater drops in mobility. Uh, controlling, because they don't have the individual data, they need to control for sort of a geographical uh, uh, things like such as, you know, maybe some counties just have more restrictions. Right, but they have a very similar argument uh, to 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 this paper, which is they're also arguing that, that it's information diffusion on a network uh, is, is is was 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 a very important factor in terms of driving uh, the the risk mitigation behavior of households. Okay, uh, so this is their data. Uh, so rather than uh, I being the individual, and it's going to be J I is the location, like some county, and then J is another place, basically. So just location I. To, to, to location J. So this is the social connectedness index. I think that Teresa probably was also on, I think they basically produced some version of this paper that was for wider consumption uh, 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 by, by academics, okay? Uh, and you know, you see a kind of a pretty similar thing. So essentially um, the, the, this is social distancing and then basically these are the guys that have a lot of connections to, 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 to epicenters, early epicenters. And, and you see that uh, they're, they're much more likely to socially distance. Uh, uh, in these, um, so people, you know, kind of places in the U.S. with with more of these connections to to China and Italy, uh, had 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 more um, social distancing behavior. Okay, so obviously the main, I think the main difference in the static design, or or is is that the individualized data allows you to then have a zip code fixed effect. Uh, so 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 that you can literally consider two people living in the same zip code. Right, as opposed to having to control for uh, some county level aggregates, which the earlier paper had to do. So they have the other big thing they have to control for is essentially like what would the policies toward a mobility restriction 
uh, in different counties in the US. Um, so, you know, a big advantage, of course, with the individualized data is with the zip code fixed effects, you don't have to worry about um, measuring, you know, local restrictions, local conditions, any type of these, these potential differences in, 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 in geographic uh, 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 conditions. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not also issues with the static design, right? So even though, um, you know, this, this graph looks kind of like nice and everything, I mean, at the end of the day, um, as the authors point out, there's also pretty likely to be non-random assignment right, of, of being connected to places of COVID-19 because uh, these were very particular places that were hit, i.e. Seattle and New York. Uh, and similarly, I mean, I think kind of, you know, even on the other uh, paper, you know, if you've got friends in China and Italy, right, and if, you have, if you're a county in the U.S. that have a bunch of, you know, higher connections to China and Italy, uh, you know, that may just mean that that population is just more tra well-traveled, they're more adaptable. They've probably basically, you know, uh, seen many more viruses, right? Uh, so, you know, SARS, MERS. Uh, so, so I have a number of friends who are uh, 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 Chinese and, 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 you know, for, for them, basically, you know, viruses are, you know, they're, they're definitely very uh, much more attuned to these sort of risk. Uh, and, and so it's not so much causal effects of networks or diffusion of information on a network per se, but just simply, you know, there's just some unobserved savviness on the part of, uh, uh, the, uh, of having these connections that it says something about your savviness, okay? So that, that's why I think kind of the most interesting um, design that speaks to uh, information diffusion is really their dynamic design, right? Because I think in the static design, I think it's just pretty hard to, to uh, um, you know, so just, you know, for, for instance, like I, I, I have, uh, um, I probably one of the, I mean, I'm not on Facebook, but, you know, so I have one of the observations is, you know, two people are living in the same zip code, you know, I have sort of another friend and, and I think basically he's just much more attuned to sort of all of these risks and we probably have very different social mobility behavior, but I'm not sure that uh, we're learning much necessarily from, 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 from the networks. Uh, so it's very hard to kind of deal with that compound. So what the paper does with the dynamic design is exactly to deal with this, 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 this confound. So then what they do is they look at uh, uh, a change in friend exposure variable, okay? Uh, which is uh, just to simply like the difference in time, right? From T to T minus one uh, in terms of, 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 of their original friend exposure variable, okay? And, and so they're going to look at kind of these, these monthly changes. Um, and they're going to basically just uh, regress then these, these monthly changes in terms of uh, friend exposures uh, to, 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 to the change in the share of days in the single tile. Okay. And, and, and so you see that also in, in differences. Uh, so here, the identification is coming uh, from the fact that um, you know, these COVID waves were going through the US at different points in time. And so it's New York, City, New York City, Seattle early versus Texas and Georgia later uh, in the cycle. And so you can see that um, when people, uh, people who have more friends uh, in New York City and Seattle uh, uh, social distance earlier, whereas people with more friends in uh, Texas and Georgia socially distance later. Okay. Uh, so that's a really nice uh, identification strategy. Um, and, you know, the there's also then a number of other results uh, that, that, that the authors use to pin down a diffusion channel. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, social mobility may be a pretty coarse measure of belief or risk perception since it also mixes in other labor flexibility attributes. So you might want to shelter in place, but you really can't. Um, I think, you know, even here, having said that, you know, even in their dynamic design, the social mobility may, may be a little bit more complicated to, to, to interpret uh, simply because, uh, you know, part of why you might want to be mobile is you want to visit some friends in these areas. And then of course, you know, you can't really visit them in the areas at the time that you want to visit them, right? Uh, so then they introduce these additional proxies for beliefs such as post supporting social distancing that, that I think very nicely also uh, speaks to the fact that it is kind of also coming through this belief channel as opposed to some other uh, uh, social distancing channel that might be uh, orthogonal to, to, to beliefs per se, okay? All right, 
And I mean, the paper started talking a little bit about the policy implications of why one might want to do this, but but you know, uh, and I think the same was true also in the other paper that I suppose that you know that means reducing frictions to communication is good uh, because. Um, you know, we can kind of learn from, from friends in our networks and, and therefore we, we can uh, uh, form uh, more rational, better uh, risk perceptions. All right, so, uh, so I'll, 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 I'll kind of follow with, with, with a few different sets of comments. I, I think, um, you know, the, the first comment is, is, is on the dynamics. I'm just gonna mostly talk about the dynamic design since that's the one that's, that's sort of the most, um, uh, 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 that's kind of the newest, most most new contribution, and, and also very convincing uh, in terms of uh, putting a, a role for information diffusion. Um, so one comment is: is is it networks, or is it just that you're learning from the local news, right? Because the nature of the waves, right? These waves are all very public news, right? And they're all pretty prominent. Basically, we all sort of understood and knew that uh, these waves were going through uh, different parts of the U.S. So, so most people, I think, in the Facebook data, uh, you know, live in like two places, have, have kind of two places where they have uh, uh, significant networks. Obviously, the place they're currently living in, and typically, is the place that uh, uh, they used to uh, grow up, right? Or maybe it was maybe one other place in the middle. Uh, they had some other uh, place they lived in for for a longer period of time. Uh, so, you know, probably most people. Uh, and I think, I don't know if this can be better than the Facebook data, but I, mean, I can just speak to my own thing is, uh, is that, you know, most people probably check up on the news uh, of where they live and also sort of probably are keeping track of the news of where they grew up. Um, and so, you know, uh, a, a, a pretty uh, simple explanation for the dynamic design is just that, you know, if people are keeping track of both kind of the local news and also some news of where they grow up as the rolling COVID waves are getting picked up by the local news, uh, they'll just naturally get some repetition of information uh, on the part of uh, uh, um, of these uh, of these individuals, and and so you know one model. I mean, I don't think that that automatically explains the results. One has to kind of have a particular learning model, right, of, of what you think people are learning uh, about uh, when they're basically seeing these waves. So, so one sort of non-social learning model you might think of with multiple signals is that um, you know. People are kind of getting multiple draws, um, you know, over time sequentially, they're getting basically different signals about the severity uh, uh, of, 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 of COVID-19. And so when they see that a wave is popping up in, in, in Georgia or Texas, that kind of leads them to infer that that may also say something about uh, 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 New York City. Now, I mean, I'm not sure I completely believe that uh, because I think probably people view the epidemics as being fairly local, but, you know, I think there's some sense in which it is true that, you know, when people basically hear about another wave, they kind of draw that, oh, you know, COVID is not over yet, you know, maybe it's still around, right? So, so that would be a very non-social learning model where um, people have some, you know, uh, set of uh, uh, local news that they're basically uh, updating on uh, that would generate something like the dynamic design. Uh, so I think in this vein, um, you know, regardless of the interpretation you give, uh, the paper, it seems like given that there's sort of these waves, it would be very interesting to think about not simply like uh, uh, kind of these diffs in social distancing, but really like cumulative social distancing outcomes over the entire uh, 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 period of COVID. So presumably um, households that seem to be kind of, that were unluckily exposed to a bunch of, uh, have a bunch of friends in a bunch of uh, cities with, with, with hitting back with COVID waves, did they end up kind of cumulatively social distancing more or for longer periods of time over the entire sample period, right? That would be kind of sort of interesting as well. I mean, I don't know that that speaks to any one particular of these two models, but, but it seems like that would be very interesting to just see uh, uh, kind of what you would call, you know, transitory behavior uh, with one wave versus like the accumulation of, 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 of a series of waves in, in other cities and how that affects your, 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 your social distancing over the entire period. Um, and and as I said, I think this is kind of very likely correlated with the frac friends variable. You know, so, so essentially the frac friends variable, to the extent that you have a very uniform distribution over different counties, you're just going to end up picking up much, much more signals, right? Uh, and then so then, uh, because, you know, basically it's the COVID waves that's the only exogenous thing that's moving, at least in, in, in the conception of this design. And so then, you know, guys with a more uniform distribution of frac friends is probably going to pick up uh, uh, more and more and more signals. Um, 
Okay. Um, so, so I, I think there, there's, there's, there's some opportunity, I think, to do um, beyond, I think, the, 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 the clever identification, uh, um, you know, something about basically the distribution of these frac friends and sort of the longer run cumulative behavior uh, outcome, behavioral differences. Um, second comment is, 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 you know, private news versus a public news. So, so you know, I, I think typically, you know, uh, uh, historically, when one thinks about uh, uh, information diffusion or word of mouth in the stock market literature, for instance, you know, I think the, the, the view is typically that public news is, 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 is obviously going to be attributed to a kind of media source. And so we want to focus on kind of private news communications as much more about, you know, kind of a word of mouth uh, channel. Um, and I think the default is typically public news, you know, should be sort of not used necessarily to kind of do identification on, on, on word of mouth channels. Uh, so it would be interesting to consider other types of news uh, as opposed to simply uh, these rolling waves uh, that, that, you know, there might be news sources that are more indigenous to social networks, right? That, you know, it's sort of what I would call kind of sense, like not, not purely public news and maybe not completely private news, because obviously that may not be uh, uh, entire, that, that's not a kind of observable, but maybe semi, like some, some like social media news, like social media gossip uh, could be sort of an interesting set of, uh, of what I would call kind of uh, other sets of news that, that, that one could use to do a very similar analysis. And, and in here, you know, I think this is sort of uh, more relevant, I think, to, to sort of the, the, the nature of how we view about uh, these networks is, is that, uh, you know, are we also influenced by sort of these other sort of fake COVID-19 news, right, uh, that, that our friends are also exposed to? You know, I mean, there's some other evidence that Fox News, for instance, uh, has influenced uh, social distancing behavior. And we also know, of course, polarization has played a huge role uh, in shaping this, 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 this outcome. So I, I think that with the design of this paper, uh, one could, I think, that shed some light on both of these issues by, by enriching the set of news sources beyond simply uh, the various, uh, the very obvious public news of 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 of, of COVID waves, and, and and you know it might be kind of interesting to quantify uh, the overall effects. In, in other words, like you know, if I were to think about uh, uh, Facebook and these networks, you know, on net, have they been positive really for thinking about uh, uh, improving social welfare by 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 uh, reducing frictions in terms of information communication, or you know. If we account for these other types of news, uh, presumably they also get, you know, if it's like fake, it also basically gets transferred out, right? Uh, and it would be interesting to kind of uh, quantify the overall effects. Uh, so a couple more comments. You know, the 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 the, the data source is pretty rich, uh, and 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 it seems like there, one could do more with with what one would call kind of the network variables, right? So so one one type of extension would be sort of some, some notion of the strength of weak ties. So, so it's not really my friends that are so important for communicating with, with me, it's really my friends' friends, right? It's kind of like these higher order, uh, further out uh, 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 iterations of friendship. So one could have, I guess, a fraction of friends that you have that have friends that are connected to places with COVID, right? Well, so you could kind of do these, these higher order iterations which essentially is gonna look a little bit like a transmission chain of, of how you think these COVID waves might have fed through different, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the network, right? And, 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 and that would also be sort of pretty interesting uh, because that would get farther away from sort of the local news sort of interpretation, right? Uh, and, and I think it's just, just generally, you know, I, I think that uh, there's a number of other network attributes that that would also be very interesting in understanding risk perception and mitigation of COVID-19. You know, I, I think that there's also like the size of the network, you know, et cetera, uh, from, from the network literature that would all be very in, in influential. Um, and it could be kind of considered in conjunction with this, with this, this, this frac friends exposure variable. Okay. And so I have a final comment. You know, so I don't know the, to what extent the data is uh, able to do this, but but you know, it strikes me that um, probably networks are also changing quite a bit over this entire COVID nineteen period. In the sense that you know, presumably uh, there can be kind of new linkages that are being formed as people uh, check up on friends or check up on friends in different cities, et cetera. Right? I mean, I don't know to what extent that's really true in the data. Uh, that the networks change a lot. 
uh, as people try to reach out to other people to acquire news, uh, because that, that, that would be a pretty interesting uh, variable that would speak exactly. I mean, it's not so much that as networks on the right-hand side variable per se, I mean, the, the endogenous formation process, the, the, you know, it's like networks are forming as people try to acquire information. Uh, and and uh, that would also be pretty interesting angle. Uh, I mean, I don't think that this, this is this paper, I think it's some other thing, but, but that would also give, I think a pretty, uh, um, you know, I'd be very interested in reading uh, that paper. All right, so conclusion. Um, you know, I, I think there's there's something very nice about this paper in terms of, of the intersection. I think of, of of themes, some old themes like networks and beliefs, and, and I think really this this mitigation theme uh, that's very interesting. I think Teresa concluded by by saying that well, you know, um, mitigation is cool because it kind of tells me that networks are 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 are, are important, not just. Um, because, you know, they're just some redundant source of news, but that, you know, public health, there's life and everything that's pretty important and therefore this matters. Uh, and I, I suppose that I think, you know, I, I never particularly thought that, I didn't really share that type, type of view. I, I think here, the, the, what I think is, is valuable is, is just that I think that in the future, you know, these, these, these sort of disasters are going to be uh, uh, much more frequent uh, uh, in, in, in terms of you believe the climate science, whether it's wildfires, whether it's, it's, it's sea level rise, whether it's hurricanes. And I see this uh, with my own friends in the Philippines uh, that they've had to grapple with, you know, really the pandemic is really only kind of one of a number of disasters they've had to grapple with. And, 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 and so that, um, and there's, there, there's very little doubt that these networks are becoming increasingly important as well uh, 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 globally in terms of these linkages. So, so I think there's something very, uh, you know, I think kind of very futuristic, very prescient, I think in the terms of this paper, uh, that I think there's a, a couple of these themes that are very likely to intersect even more uh, in the future. All right, I'm gonna stop there, thanks. Thank you very much, Harrison, uh, for this very detailed discussion. Uh, Theresa, would you like to respond? That'd be great. First of all, thanks so much, Harrison, for the discussion. This is great, and that's a use uh, a lot a lot of really useful uh, feedback. Um, so let me just speak to a few of the points uh, you've raised. Um, first of all, I want to mention that I think we totally agree that you know the dynamic design um, is the one that. Um, really is a more reliable one that takes us from mostly suge suggestive to like much harder to argue with. Um, and I, I feel like in every iteration of the paper, we, we, we stress that more. I want to briefly um, speak to the earlier other paper you mentioned um, and the uh, the SEI data, the social connectedness data that they actually use is um, based on our earlier work um, of um, publishing Facebook connections locally. Um, and so you know, we're very happy that people are using those data for all of these these purposes because we do think that was exactly our intention. Um, people being able to use network connection data at the um, at this level to to answer other questions. I think you know this paper at hand, um, as you pointed out, we do see the. Um, the big contribution in being able to control for local zip code fix effects. And that's not just because of um, being able to kind of dummy out rather than directly control for local restrictions. We do have an earlier paper and for lack of that, you know, lack of identification, we ultimately published that as a conference proceeding, but we do show that even conditional on other observables, um, having more SEI connections to early hotspots in Italy and China actually predicts cases. And so that's kind of like, you know, a little bit the concern that if you look at the local dis social distancing, that areas that, um, have more connections to these hotspots, they are learning probably, and I think you know we're, we're, the, the conclusion we definitely support about the dangers of the pandemic, but they also actually do have higher caseloads. And so it's kind of hard to disentangle um, those, um, those two uh, effects. So I think you know, we see much of this work as we being very complimentary. And I think you pointed out that many of these papers um, came, came out beforehand. And so I think, you know, it was a pandemic. Everyone tried to learn about these things. And so I think the conclusion definitely, we 
stands and we see our paper saying like you know we, we reach the same conclusion but we can also rule out a maybe not negligible concern with, with some of these earlier papers um in terms of some of your other comments um so i think that the point about the local news is uh, is well taken um that with the specifications we currently have it is to be honest, not something we can completely rule out that um, the mechanism is that you just follow the news more in the areas where you have friends. Um, we've done a little bit and we can probably do more in terms of if you just think it's the hometown, we could you know, take out people's hometown where they grew up. Um, we've done this in earlier work. Um, we have some evidence from our early housing paper that um, where, where we can rule out that it's just coming from local news because we there we have a measure of whether people report talking to their friends in that case about housing and we do find this network effect only for people who say that they do talk to their friends about this topic and we don't find it for people who say they do not um, indicating that it was just the following the news channel that that wouldn't be consistent with this but in the setting you're absolutely right um we can't fully rule that out and i i think you know we have to be honest that that's possibly part of it um in in terms of other news channels um you know i absolutely agree that i think there is a big factor for, for fox news and this polarization um I, I think we kind of see ourselves being a little bit somewhat abstracting from that for two reasons um the first one is that we just do not observe um many of that other news consumption um you know, we can't see who Fox, who ultimately watches Fox News. Um, we don't know people's political orientation. And so some of that, if you think about what would you use to proxy for these, you would probably use things like age, gender, education, and uh, narrow location, which is what we have in our fixed effects. And so I think some of that is absorbing this. So you could think of this as, people who you know maybe have a similar propensity to be exposed to these other news sources that this is the incremental effect of of the network effect and we can't kind of say how much uh, how much that that um that absorbs um finally spoke about the the weak ties that you know absolutely something we could um uh, we could do at at some point and uh i i think you're right that we haven't um, yeah, we kind of in our baseline specification treat friends as friends and haven't looked at those second order um, effects. Um, again, we do have, you know, from from our earlier work, generally these do go um, in the same direction that you know you generally find closer friends do have um, a bigger effect on 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 people's outcomes, um, what, whatever it is. Um, and finally, endogenous formation of networks. Um, we haven't looked at this. Um, generally, what we found is that there isn't a lot of change in networks over time, um, at least not for people who have been pretty stable users. Um, obviously, when someone newly joins or newly becomes active, there's a lot of activity. but you know, that's not what you want to interpret as new friending. And so I, I think, you know, it, it might be worthwhile to look at it, but I'm kind of not that confident that we just see a lot of action because honestly, if you don't like, it, it takes a lot to really defriend someone um, rather than just ignore that person. So I, I think that would be interesting and we, we should look at it, um, but that's kind of like the reason we haven't so far. Um, and then finally, I, I, I very much agree with you that these networks and um, or disasters are becoming more frequent and the climate space is definitely one, one of those areas. Um, and it would be really interesting to, 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 to think more about that. Um, I just see in, in, in the chat, uh, which is question, um, what's the frequency of, of the data? Um, so would, do you, do you mean the SCI or do you mean the data in our paper? Just so I can answer precisely. 
Yeah, I was I, I was typing this as you were talking about um, that you don't know how to disentangle media uh, from other news. I was wondering if you can use the higher frequency. Uh, so, I mean, given that a place has a certain exposure, news will be different every day still, and posts will be different every day. So um, I was wondering if you can use, if you have a high frequency of um, where people go, how they react immediately to news, how they react immediately to certain posts, because those will vary per person, even um, if uh, you have exposure to the same place. Yeah, so we could definitely, so the um, mobility data is basically daily, so you could do to some extent do this on the daily level with the small caveat that we see strong day of week patterns. Um, so you probably wouldn't want to compare um, you know, behavior on a Saturday to behavior on a Friday because we know those are, are just very different. And so you want to kind of partial that out a little bit. Um, on the post, I mean, we know the exact date of a post. Um, what is there, like, I, you know, looking at high frequency at that level is a little bit harder because posting and you know the, the the caveat is that we have public posts is for most again this was a reaction to what you said yeah. about media so if you want to know who consumes which media you can see what they post and which what they forward so if someone forwards posts a lot of fox news then they probably consume fox news etc yeah that's true i mean i i think we, we have some media consumption i think the the concern there is that um there's a lot of media and Fox News consumption that we don't see. And so it, it, this is somewhat a, a, a noisy measure. But yes, well taken. Um, I see yeah. another race. Olga, I think and Olga by has Olga, a question. Yeah, yeah uh, I think uh, I might have missed it. Uh, uh, but uh, do you uh, control for the health status? If some, do, you, do you have a measure if, for example, I have COVID? Because I mean, the, how many friends around me have COVID and my location is very highly correlated with me having COVID and then my beliefs about COVID and its uh, transmission and like uh, credibility of uh, threat is uh, very much correlated with me experiencing it. Yeah, so we do not know whether you have COVID um, is the, the, the answer. Like, you know, we just can't tell. Um, we know your location, so we can control for local um, cases of I mean, the, the local fixed effects would take out local cases, which is somewhat correlated with your own personal probability of um, having COVID. I also want to mention that um, we, we've done this with varying degrees of non-local friends. So basically, we can do everything with out-of-state friends, and it goes through. And I think that maybe also speaks a little bit to the point that Harrison raised earlier, to what extent might some of this reduction in mobility be driven by, you know, you're less likely to visit uh, friends in high COVID areas because they maybe have more restrictions. If you think that, you know, out-of-state friends are a probably, I mean, those you basically don't see that much in person. And so you are a lot less likely to actually get infected by them. And you probably also um, don't visit them that often. So I think that would be a small part in your overall mobility is visiting out of state friends. And so the fact that we find basically identical results there, I, I think is, is, is mostly coming from that. I do want to mention that even in the baseline specification that includes um, local friends, because everyone in the same location has you know, their share of local friends is similar and the distribution of local friends is very similar. Even most of the variation there is coming from the non-local friends with the only additional kind of small um, variation coming from how many local versus non-local friends you have. Okay, so you should really think of if I look at two people living in the same location because they tend to have local friends in the same areas, differences in these people's networks are driven by generally farther away non-local friends, mostly out-of-state friends. And that's why we basically find the same results when we just focus on those out-of-state friends. 
I yeah. had a related, a related question, which yeah. was on the general level. So there are two types of information, right? There is general information about COVID, like my unconditional distribution, right? If you want to put it this way. And there's, there's my conditional probability of being affected by COVID, of, you know, traveling less because my friends have COVID. So, you know, which, which part do you think is most important? Is, is you know, is a social network shaping the unconditional distribution or more the conditional distribution of, of getting COVID or? Hmm. I mean, I, I think that's hard to say. I do want to say that I think it comes more about like, you know, voluntary reductions in your local behavior, just because I, you know, we are probably a part of the population that that uh, is more affected by the direct travel restrictions and by being less likely to see out of state friends and visiting them. I, I think the average person just does not do um, that much you know, travel um, and is that directly affected by what happens in other places. Um, and so I, I think for most people, that's a relatively small thing. I, you know, my hunch, but I mean, just be, because of that is I, I think it's more uh, um, kind of just it, it. I think it just feels kind of closer and more credible if you hear that from a friend. You know, there's maybe one thing to say uh, to see in the news um, New York City having cooling trucks in front of the emergency rooms. There's maybe that hits you more if you talk to your friend and they say like, yeah, we you know went for a walk. I, they are cooling trucks um, and you just hear the ambulances. Um, so I, I think that kind of like is most of the mechanism that it does feel just a little bit more personal, a little bit hitting closer to home when people hear this from their friends uh, where it's like a concrete person rather than some abstract news piece the same way that you might hear about, you know, a, a typhoon in the Philippines. Um, and but I have, you know, that's just our hunch. In some sense, we can't completely pin like which way that channel goes, except for saying that, you know, given that it's mostly out of state friends and most people don't really trouble that much to see the out of state friends, we don't think it's purely the effect of, well, now I reduce my mobility because I'm not going to visit my out of state friend every weekend. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Yilan has a has posted a question online. I don't know if you want to. Oh yeah. Let me. Sorry. Let me read this. Um, yeah. So I, I think she said that people can um, have settings where they can influence um, which posts um, people see. Um, so I. First of all, I want to clarify which type of posts um, we are using in our analysis. So for um, privacy reasons, we can only use posts that have a public setting so that actually everyone on the internet can see those posts. So if you have a post that you restrict to a certain audience, um, this post is off the table in terms of our analysis uh, for privacy concerns. So, you know, we, 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 we can argue, and I, I think, you know, there is probably a difference between posts that people are uh, willing to make publicly and posts where they have a more restricted audience. So now the part that we can measure, I think of this as like, people are very happy to basically pronounce their opinions to the world because these are public posts. Um, might they say things differently in more private posts, in more private conversations? Possible, um, we, we, we can't measure that um, for you know, the, the reasons that there are just too much concerns about privacy in, in looking into this type um, of, of communication. And so for, for that reason, um, we, we, we can't really look at it. I think one other thing that um, this touches on a little bit was Harrison's suggestion of looking at um, the endogenous network formation. Um, I think we can see, so what you can do is, even if you don't unfriend someone, you can block their posts from showing up in your in your newsfeed. And so I, I, I think basically, you know, what, what we could do is you, we could say like, 
are you restricting interactions with these people by either looking at unfriending, which we know is actually not that common, but maybe it's more common to block people from your newsfeed. And so there's, um, there, there, might be, there might be more um, over that. Thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, well, uh, everyone Kim, is convinced. <laughs> what? Everyone is convinced or too polite yes, to contradict at this clear. point. <laughs> we post our comments on Facebook. Yes, <laughs> publicly. <laughs> Wait, I, I think there was just a question coming up in the chat. Yeah, from Pedro. Uh, from Pedro Barroso. Yeah, so I, I think he's he's worried about um, reverse causality um, in terms of people who social distance less, um, ultimately getting higher um, higher uh, uh, COVID rates in in their networks. Um, so the the first thing I want to mention is that when we measure the COVID exposure in your um, in your network, we measure the local case rates where your friends live, and we condition on people living in the same location. Okay, and so I think you know what you would need to argue is that um, the the people who themselves social distance less, they see ultimately higher. Um, higher area level case rates in the areas where where their friends um, where their friends are. Um, and so I, I think you know in, in the sense that we are controlling for for the location, the kind of like between regions spread of disease should um, somewhat be, um, be be controlled for by people being in the same location and ultimately like, you know, I, I think we know by now that a lot of the um, a lot of the individual risk is also the local case rates rather than just those those friendship nexus, especially since these are really the variation is driven by distant friends. Okay, so if you have friends in areas that have higher case rates, you tend to social distance more. But I think you know, for, for the reverse, that, that effect would need to be really, really strong that you can really affect the, the um, local outcomes, which you know, at this point are like hundreds and thousands um, of, of cases. Thank you. So Kim, uh, Roman and I would like to uh, thank Teresa and Harrison for this high quality uh, session. And also I'd like to thank the audience for being with us in the new year. <laughs>